Jokolo de Bruna Katoto Loto Bila da Bambre Negadigale de Baba Barakate Nekeli da Baba Bayanagalina Managadi Gelia Egebo Jacele de Brina Katolo de Bambre Nagele ne Mamanga Negalida Boro Kotoski Kelida Barra Katina Kalina Mamame Gelina Maninga Galida Bajokolo do Borokoto Nekele ne Maya Angebo Zotole de Brihaha. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus. Father, we rejoice that this morning we are complete in you. And we thank you for the privilege of having access into the deep things of God by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for words which the Holy Ghost teaches. And we rejoice that as we listen to your word, we'll be comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Thank you that your people are built up, equipped, edified, and Jesus is glorified. Thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our feet together as we say these words. I am born of God. I am born of the word. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus' name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. We want to welcome everybody connected to us by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, and all the various platforms around the world. And our campuses, we're glad to have everybody connected. You get ready. The word is going to build you up and you will never be the same again. Can I have a powerful amen? amen. Are we excited about the privilege of fellowshipping today? Can we celebrate the opportunity we have to fellowship in this place? Glory. You know, it's an opportunity we have to be able to fellowship like this today. In so many countries, in so many states, even in Nigeria here, people have been asked to lock down because of the, you know, situation globally. But it's a blessing that in a quiet bomb state, we don't have that situation, you know, around us. And people are free today to worship in churches. It's a joy. And we must use the opportunity to appreciate God and to also, you know, pray for places where it's, they've been affected that they will recover very fast, you know, that people will get back on their feet. Those that have been afflicted, that they will recover fast. Amen? The Bible says, if any, is any afflicted, let him pray. The effectual five and prayer of a righteous man avail it much. It says the Lord will raise him up. The prayer of faith will heal the sick. So we stand in faith for people that are in areas where there is this um, corona nonsense, and we declare that the same way it came, it will vanish. Amen. The same way it came, it will vanish. Thus far it has come, no further shall it go. We declare the defeat of that situation. The conspiracy behind it, we expose and disgrace it. In the mighty name of Jesus, we declare that people that are in hospitals right now, the healing power of God reaches out to them. Medications will be effective. Medications will be effective. Medications will be effective. And where miracles are needed, we agree together that they receive miracles. In the mighty name of Jesus. We declare victory for the people of God and we declare victory for everyone in Jesus' precious name. Can I hear a powerful amen? amen? Can we celebrate the victory that we have over this situation around the world? Amen. Glory to God. Is that celebration or is... Amen. Glory to God. Amen. amen. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self this morning. Praise God. <clears throat> I started teaching in the morning's first service. Today I will, inv I will advise you to get the material of the first service very specifically. And not just the first service, but all of this conference beginning from Wednesday when we began the training evangelism and discipleship season two, our third, you know, season two. Uh, we began to talk about evangelism and soul winning. It's been very effective. The reason is very simple, like I said to those in the first service. The essence for church is for training. He that descended, is he that ascended up on high. He gave gifts to men for the perfecting of the saints. The reason why we have you in church is to perfect you, to equip you, to train you, to train you. You know, the essence for the training is to do the work of ministry so that the body of Christ can be edified. Every time you come here, I have a responsibility from Jesus to train you and equip you, to build you up and bring you to a place where you are 
enriched in the things of God, where you can do ministry effectively. You know, uh, because in times like this, only churches that have trained people to do ministry will survive. Churches where people have been trained to do ministry, those are the only churches that will survive. I mean, you can imagine, God forbid, that a situation arises globally where churches are shut down for several months, one year. Nobody is permitted to come to church. So what do we do? There will still have to be evangelism. People will still have to be born again. People will still have to pray. People will still have to fellowship in one way or the other. And that can only be effective through house churches. People will now start meeting in houses, 10, 15 in clusters. And for these clusters to be effective, there must be people among them who can do ministry among them. And if you don't have people trained, when things like this happen, then the whole church is, 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 is confused. The people become sheep without a shepherd. Are you understanding? And that is why church must be given to training. We train you, we prepare you, we equip you. Because that is the way the ministry can be done. So every time you come here and we have the opportunity to be together like this, it's an opportunity for training. The essence for ministry is not entertainment. He didn't give gifts to men for entertainment. He didn't give gifts to men for fun fair. It's not a place to come and dance and sweat and feel nice and just be. No, the essence for church is more serious than that. It is for the work of the ministry so that the body of Christ can be edified. So that the people of God are built up. That's why when you come here, it's just teaching, teaching, teaching. It's not like we cannot preach and make you shout and feel nice. I mean, that, that's easy. Anybody can do that. I can keep you shouting for the next three hours. Next three hours. You won't even feel it. You'll be so happy. You'll just be shouting. But at the end of the day, you're going home with nothing. We don't want to hype you. We want to equip you. The essence for ministry is not hyping. It's equipping. See, I hear you. It's for equipping. So take everything we're teaching you serious and see yourself as a minister of the gospel. See yourself as a minister of Jesus Christ. The book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14, is a scripture we've been dealing with in the course of the week. 2 Corinthians, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us. Maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us. That's a good place to underline. By us. The manifestation of the savor of his knowledge is by us. And the venue is in every place. Make it manifest the savor of his knowledge by us. The word triumph in Christ is an old word. It means the trophy of victory or the proof of victory. We are the proof of Jesus' victory. We are the trophy of Jesus' victory. That the victory that Jesus obtained, we are the proof of that victory. And because we are the proof of that victory, all that Christ did, he did it in us. So since all that he did, he did it in us, it is now our responsibility to take what he has done in us and turn it into ministry to others. We take what he has done in us and turn it into ministry to others. The finished work of Christ in us becomes now our ministry to others. Knowing who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ in turn becomes our ministry to share with other people. Make him manifest the savor of his grace. And we traveled quite through a number of things this morning. We dealt with the character of God. We dealt with the gospel. We dealt with the preaching of the gospel, which is very critical. Now, please take note of this. In Romans chapter 1 verse 16, brother Paul says, Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So the gospel is the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel does not have power. The gospel is the power. It is the power. So the preaching of the gospel is the preaching of power unto salvation. That means the power of God can only be seen within the confines of salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Outside of salvation, you can't see the power of God. The power of God only works within the framework of salvation. And the gospel is a conveyor of God's power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. God's desire is to have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. In Romans chapter 10, brother Paul says, My heart desire for Israel is that they may be saved. 
For I bear them record that they have the zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So they forsake the righteousness of God and they go about establishing their own righteousness. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed. So the preaching of the gospel is the revelation of God's righteousness. The righteousness of God, not the righteousness of man. So the gospel is predicated on what Christ has done. The gospel, the preaching of the gospel is predicated on what Christ has done. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Therein in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. So the preaching of the gospel is the revelation of God's righteousness. The revelation of God's righteousness. The revelation of God's righteousness. The more we talk about the gospel of Christ, the more we are revealing God to people. The more we talk about the gospel of Christ, the more we are revealing God to people. You must learn to share the gospel. You must learn to share the gospel. The more of the word you know, the more of the word you know, the more stable and effective you will be in sharing the gospel. The more of the word of God you know, the more stable and effective you will be in sharing the gospel. The more of the word of God you appreciate, the more of the word of God you appreciate, the more effective you will be in sharing the gospel. Let me take you through Brother Peter. Let's travel together through Brother Peter. Write this down in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 11. You will see that there was a difference in Peter's sermon. The more you grow in the knowledge of the word of God, the more effective you are preaching. The more you grow in the knowledge of the word of God, the more precise, the more accurate, the more clearer your message. The more you grow in the knowledge of God's word. It got bit better for Peter. As he grew, he became more accurate in his preaching. Because the more you hear the gospel, the more you share the gospel, the more precise you become. The more you hear the gospel, the more you share the gospel, the more precise you become. The more you hear the gospel, the more you share the gospel, the more precise you become. Some of us, when we got saved, you can spend six weeks trying to preach to one person. But as you grew in knowledge, as you grew in knowledge, you became more effective. Such that you can share the gospel with six people in a day. But in the beginning, it could be clumsy. A message of 30 minutes, you will use three hours. What you're supposed to say in five minutes, you will use 30 minutes. Because you lack, you lack utterance. Because you are not given to practice. Because you have, you have not built your word bank such that you can pull out resources from the abundance of your heart and walk your way through explaining the gospel. So the more you feed on the word, the more you teach the word, the more accurate and precise your ministry becomes. Am I communicating here? That's why teaching and learning has no alternative. As you grow in the word of God, the more effective. Look at Peter. Acts chapter 2 verse 37. Acts chapter 2. Pay attention because I want you to see the difference in the message. Acts 2 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Next verse, 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Next verse, 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Look at Acts chapter 3 verse 18. Pay attention. Acts chapter 3 verse number 18. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, 
he had so fulfilled. Next verse. Now pay attention to next verse. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. In the two messages, there is one word that, is, that has appeared two times. It appeared in the first one and it has appeared in this one. What was it? Repent. Okay, very good. You are taking note. Repent. Okay, look at the next one. Acts chapter 4 verse 10. Acts chapter 4 verse 10. He called salvation repentance. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God had raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 5.31. All of these are Peter's sermons. Acts 5.31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Acts chapter 10 verse 39. Peter's sermon in the house of Cornelius. Acts chapter 10 verse 39. Now something will change in his teaching. Because by chapter 10, he has grown, he has matured, he has learned a lot. So look at it as he begins to change. And we are witnesses of all this, which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hung on a tree. 40. Him God raised up by the, th the third day and showed him openly. 41. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us. Who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead? 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth. See the difference? He's no more talking repent. He's talking believeth. In him shall receive remission of sins. So his message begins to be more precise. It begins to be more clearer because the man is maturing. Put up that scripture for me again. In him shall receive remission of sins. Next verse. Next verse. While Peter yet spake those words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Are you, are you, are you following? You see the change. In Acts chapter 15, he makes a comment in the council in Jerusalem. Acts 15 verse 7. Acts 15 verse 7, Peter. And when they had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Did you see that? Next verse. And God which knoweth the hearts, bore them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Are you still here? 9, verse 9. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Next verse. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Look at 11. But we believe, we believe through the grace of God, that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Did you see that his message has changed? As he grew, his message became clearer, more precise, and more exact. So as you grow in the word, you will be effective in sharing the word. As you grow in the word, you will be effective in sharing the word. So Peter began to share the word to the Gentiles. Asia, Rome, Corinth, as you hear and as, as you preach, you hear, you preach, you hear, you preach, you get more better. As you hear, you preach, you get more better. So your scriptural growth will affect how effective you are in sharing Christ. Your growth in the scriptures will affect how effective you are 
in sharing Christ. Look at another guy by the name of Apollos in Acts chapter 18 verse 24. We are talking about evangelism. Acts 18 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos born at Alexandra, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. Next verse. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord knowing only the baptism of John. That's a lacuna there for him. Knowing only the baptism of John. Next verse. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. They interpreted, expounded diharmonia. Now as a result of that, something happened to Apollos. Look at verse 28. Verse 28. Acts 18, 28. For he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. His message became more precise. His message became more Christ-centered. He's no more eloquent, mighty in scriptures, knowing only the baptism of John. He has grown now. He is now able to show by the scriptures, both in public and private, that Jesus was the Christ. Are we still here? So by opening himself to hear the truth of the gospel, he became more effective. He didn't allow pride to stop him. Because some people, their problem is pride, even in the ministry. Some ministers that should humble themselves and ask questions and learn and grow and make adjustments where they make, need to make adjustments so they, they can be more effective. Pride will not allow them. Instead, they will just be bad-mouthing us, looking for how to block us, looking for how to stop people from hearing us. And coronavirus has made people to be hearing us. They called us social media preachers. Today, all of them have come to join us in social media. It's true now. Instead of them to humble themselves, make adjustments, learn, grow, and be more efficient in ministry and teaching of the word, they, they, pride will not allow them. They say, no, what I have been preaching all my life, I will continue to preach it. Keep preaching it until nobody is listening to you. Because the message of Christ is growing. No matter the age of a lie, a lie is a lie. And eventually the truth will expose the lie. True or false. So it's better you make adjustments and learn. Apollos was humble. Apollos was meek. Apollos submitted himself to Aquila and Priscilla. They took him and taught him and taught him and taught him. When he came back, it was not about eloquence. When he came back, it was not about quoting scriptures like water, pa, 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 without explanation. When he came back, he began to explain that Jesus was the Christ. Are we still in the building here? So the more you learn, the more efficient, the more effective. You become a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly ototomioing the word of truth. Dividing the word. Are we in the building? So the gospel is about God's forgiveness. We established that in the first service. The gospel is about God's forgiveness of sins. The gospel, because you are going to preach it. The gospel is about God's forgiveness of sins. Look at Luke 24, 47. Luke 24, 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Among all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem. What are we to preach? Repentance and remission of sins. 1 John chapter 2 verse 2. 1 John chapter 2 verse 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. For the sins of how many people? The sins of the whole world. So Jesus is the propitiation or the payment for the sins of the whole world. So the gospel announces God's forgiveness. 
The gospel is the announcement of God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness is not what God does. God's forgiveness is what God gives. God's forgiveness is not what God does. God's forgiveness is God's offer to the sinner. God's forgiveness is the grace of God offered to the sinner who cannot qualify. God's forgiveness is God's offer. Is God's offer of grace. The forgiveness of sins. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19. So the gospel announces God's forgiveness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19. Pay attention. That God, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Pay attention. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. No, 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 no. Wait, wait. Give me the message. The message of that place. The message translation. I want to highlight that. Not, not imputing. We are 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Not 20. God put the whole square with himself through the Messiah. Giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. He has given the world a fresh start. He's not holding the world accountable for sin. He's not punishing anybody. He has given the world a fresh start by offering to them the forgiveness of sins. Give me the, the Amplified. Amplified. Amplified translation. And after that, you give me the NLT. Amplified. 2 Corinthians 5.19. Amplified. Hallelujah. Amplified. If you can't find, okay. God exalted him. No, how did you get to Acts 5? You got amplified, but you're using us to do practicals. Let me get it from the Bible. Glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 19, amplified. Glory, 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 glory. I like the Amplified. The Amplified version, 2 Corinthians 5.19. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. Is that in black and white? Not counting people's sins against them but canceling them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That is restoration to favor with God. So if God is canceling people's sins, how will coronavirus be God's punishment? God is canceling people's sins. He's not holding them accountable for sin. Give me the NLT. NLT. Same scripture. The NLT. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Is it getting clear? So, it's so important to know that God does not hold any sinner accountable. And somebody said, does God overlook sin? No. God does not overlook sin. Does God treat sin casually? No. What does God do to sin? He punishes sin. And he punishes sin se severely. But this is the difference. He punishes it on himself on our behalf. So faith in him frees us from sin and its consequences. Is it clear here? Right. Now, in evangelism, you must emphasize that. The second thing you must emphasize here is there is a term that is often used in evangelism. 
Give your life to Christ. Give your life to Christ. Give your life to Christ. That term is not biblical in salvation. That term is not biblical in salvation. In salvation, you don't give. In salvation, you receive. John 1, 12. As many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. John 1, 12. As many as receive him, so in salvation, you receive God's offer. In salvation, you receive God's offer. In salvation, you don't give God anything. You believe and receive. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But have ever, so in salvation, you don't give your life to Christ. You have no life to give Christ. A sinner is dead. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. In salvation, you don't give your life. You have no life to give. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. A sinner is dead. He is dead to God and dead to righteousness. So a sinner has no life to give. Rather, a sinner receives God's offer. John 6, 47. John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So salvation is to receive what God offers. When you preach and evangelize, you must always use the right words. You must always use the right words. When Philip went to Samaria, they gave report and said, Samaria had received. Acts 8, 14. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. Samaria had what? Received. So in salvation, you receive. You don't give. We don't give our lives to Christ. You receive life. You don't give life in salvation. You receive life. He is the one that quickened us. We didn't quicken him. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 and 6. He is the one that quickened us. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Look at the next verse. And had raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly in Christ. So in salvation, you don't give your life. He is the one that gave his life. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. He is the one that gave his life. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God commended his love toward us. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. He gave his life for us. Are you still in the building? So God gave his son. You receive his son. He that spared not his son, but gave him up. Romans chapter 8 verse 37. He that spared not his son, but gave him up. Did I say 37? Romans chapter 8 verse 32. Is it 31 or 32? Romans chapter 8 verse 32. He that spared not his son, but delivered him up. So it is God that gave his life for us. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? When you know that, you tell people to believe and receive God's life. Believe and receive God's life. Don't give your life. You don't have life. When you give people an impression that at salvation they are giving God something, you make them come to God with a performance mentality. You make them come to God as if they are doing God a favor. You are not doing God a favor, so you are not giving him something. Rather, he is doing you a favor, he is giving you himself. 
I, 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 I am come that you may have. I am come that you may have life. So in salvation, we don't give God. In salvation, we receive from God. Colossians 3, 4. When Christ who is our life shall appear. When Christ who is our life shall appear. Then shall you also appear with him in glory. So in salvation, we receive God's life. We receive God's offer. Christ comes in to give us life. Are we still in the building? The second thing you must take note of in preaching is that the gospel is not asking people to obey God. The gospel is not asking people to obey God. The gospel is not asking people to follow God. I have decided. My, my singing ministry is on vacation today. To follow Jesus. So, in salvation, it's not I have decided to follow Jesus. Mm -mm. In salvation, it's not the wall behind me, the cross before me. Eh, that's not salvation. The problem with the church today is, we teach discipleship as salvation. And we teach salvation as discipleship. We teach discipleship as salvation. Then we teach salvation as discipleship. In salvation, you are not deciding to follow Jesus. It's not your decision. It's his decision that you respond to. In salvation, it is Jesus' decision that you respond to. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave himself for us. So that is why in salvation, you are just a recipient of what God offers. Are we teaching good here? So it is not a following of Jesus. It is not a, an obeying of Jesus. God surrendered all. God gave you. You are the recipient. So what is wrong with I surrender all in salvation? You don't surrender anything. You are dead. You are dead. You don't surrender anything. He surrendered himself for you to have. Teaching good. We don't surrender in salvation. You know altar call. They do altar call. People gather on the pulpit. I surrender. I... <laughs> Leave all that, my friend. You didn't surrender anything. Salvation is a place of celebration. That a man came from death to life. Salvation is a place of jubilation. That what I didn't qualify for has been given to me free of charge. Are we in the building here? It's not a place of crying. And if there is crying, it should be tears of joy. <laughs> eh, eh. We are not mourning. It has been done. We are not crying for God to die again. He has died. We are only celebrating the gift of his grace. Oh, hallelujah. So salvation is not surrender all. It is after you are saved, you are now in Christ. Discipleship is surrender all for ministry. It is for ministry you surrender all. I give God my time. I give God my moments. I give God my hand. I give God my voice to use in preaching the gospel. That is where you surrender. It is called consecration. You don't do it for salvation. You do it after salvation in consecration. I surrender all. Use me. I'm available. Use my hands. Use my voice to preach your word. Use my hands to heal the sick. Use my voice to comfort those that are lost. That is after you are saved. It's not before you are saved. Before you are saved, you have nothing that God can use. Before you are saved, you are a total liability. You are a collateral irresponsibility. God has no nothing in you that he can use. It is after you are saved, you are now a part of his family. 
You now become his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You now become a co-laborer with God. That is when he can use you. Am I talking to somebody here? Yeah. So in salvation, you don't surrender. But after you are saved, you surrender. That's why you're here. That's why we're going for evangelism from tomorrow every day aggressively till next Sunday. It's a full week of evangelism. You will suspend your schedule. You will suspend your appointments. You will suspend your leisure. You will suspend your pleasures. You will invest hours into the advancement of God's kingdom. That is when you can say, I have decided to follow Jesus. In following Jesus, you are following him to do the work of the ministry. Are we teaching here? That's when you can say, I surrender all. You surrender things that you will have used to make yourself happy so that you can push the kingdom of God. And it is in that that there is a reward. There is no reward for salvation. It's not your work. It's his work. But there is reward after salvation in service. Am I, am I, am I communicating well? These are concepts you must understand. So you can be a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You must preach Christ's obedience for us, not we obeying. His obedience was on our behalf. So his obedience is our obedience. What we call obedience is what we call believe. When you believe the gospel, what you've done is you have received Christ's obedience. He obeyed, not as I will, your will be done. He obeyed for our salvation. When you believe what he has done, his obedience becomes your obedience. That's what the Bible says. You have believed from the heart. That form of doctrine that was given to you. You have believed from the heart. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. So we preach Christ's obedience for us. When you read obedience in the epistles, it means to believe. When you read obedience in the epistles, it means to believe. So how do you obey good news? You don't obey good news. You only give good news. Any good news that you have to obey is no more good news. It means it's a demand. It is good news because there is nothing for you to do than to take. Is it true? That's why it's good news. So you don't obey good news. You receive good news. Once obedience enters, it is no more a finished work. So the obedience is Christ's obedience on our behalf. Am I teaching good? Yeah. Romans chapter 1 verse 5. Look at it. You will see the way brother Paul wrote it. Romans chapter 1 verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith, which is faith in Christ. See the way he uses obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Look at Romans chapter 5 verse 19. So the gospel is Christ has obeyed God for us. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Christ's obedience made us righteous. Christ's obedience made us righteous. Are you still in the building? So in sharing the gospel, ensure you are not extracting commitment from anybody. Ensure you are not extracting commitment from anybody. In sharing the gospel, ensure you are not extracting commitment from anybody. Don't say, are you ready to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Are you ready to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? You are extracting a commitment. And he doesn't have the ability to say yes to that request. If he did, he wouldn't need Christ. Don't extract a commitment. In the preaching of the gospel, you preach faith. People believe they are saved. You don't extract commitment. Don't ask them, are you ready to surrender all? Are you ready to surrender all? If you are ready to surrender all, say with me. The things I used to do, I do them no more. You have left Christ. You have met Moses and two of you have partnered. Salvation is not the things I used to do, I do no more. Salvation is a resurrection from the dead. 
Salvation is new life. It's not develop improvement. It's not becoming a better person. Salvation is a brand new life. We are his workmanship created. When you create something, it doesn't have a history. A creation is a new start. Am I teaching good? If I'm teaching good, say I hear you. The people said, what must I do to be saved? Look at the answer. Acts 16, 30. Acts chapter 16, verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Four keys to salvation. Number one, be circumcised. Number two, pay tight. Number three, confess all your sins. Number four, fall down on the ground and cry with sackcloth and ashes. No, that's not salvation. What must I do to be saved? Look at it. Where we're reading. Give me, give me that scripture again. What must I do to be saved? 31. And they said, believe. Believe. No steps. Salvation is faith in what Christ has done. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved and thy house. Period. Are we in the building here? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we preach Jesus' crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection for salvation. Don't help the gospel. Just preach the gospel, it will save. Don't help the gospel. Just preach the gospel, it will save. Just preach the gospel, it will save. So Jesus said to the disciples, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Acts 1.8. You shall receive power. Then you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 1 verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. The Spirit of God is given to us to the intent that we are able to share the gospel of Christ. The Spirit of God is given to us to the intent that we are able to share the gospel of Christ. No man can call Jesus Lord but by the Holy Ghost. No man can call Jesus Lord but by the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 12.3 1 Corinthians 12.3 Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God called Jesus a cost and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. It's two ways. Number one that is the recipient of the gospel will call Jesus Lord because he has had the right gospel. The recipient of the gospel will call Jesus Lord because he has had the right gospel. So this is, this is it. It takes the spirit of God which we have to share the gospel. It takes the spirit of God which we have to share the gospel. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Do you have the Holy Spirit? If you have the Holy Spirit, shout Holy Spirit. It takes the Holy Spirit which we have to share the gospel. Number two. It takes the Spirit of God which you have for your recipient to believe the gospel. It takes the Spirit of God which you have for your recipient to receive the gospel. First of all, it takes the Spirit of God which you have for you to share the gospel. Number two, it takes the spirit of God which you have for your recipient to believe the gospel. So both you and the recipient, you are all works of the Holy Ghost. It's the work of the Holy Ghost. The spirit equips us to share the gospel. And the spirit will have men to accept the gospel. The spirit equips us to share the gospel. 
and the spirit helps men to receive the gospel. Sharing the gospel and having men believe the gospel is not by might nor by power. It's by the spirit. Sharing the gospel and having men believe the gospel is not by might nor by power but by the spirit. You didn't hear what I said. Sharing the gospel and having men believe the gospel is not by might nor by power but by the spirit. I'm saying as you go out to share the gospel trust the Holy Spirit in you to communicate the word. As you go out to share the gospel trust the Holy Spirit in you to communicate the word. Trust the Holy Spirit in you to witness to the people. To witness to them. Don't trust your prowess. Don't trust your grammar. Don't trust your constructions. Don't trust your eloquence. All those is useless. Trust the Holy Ghost to be a witness to the word. And trust the Holy Ghost to help the hearer to receive the gospel. That's what brother, brother Peter was saying. Acts chapter 2 verse 17. Acts chapter 2 verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days. I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. Give me verse 18. Sons and daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see. Shall, shall dream dreams. And old, I mean young men shall see vision. Old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and my handmaidens. I will pour in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. Next verse. And I will show wonders in heaven and all of that. Next verse, 20. The Psalm 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Mark 16, 15 to 20. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. Mark 16, 16, 15. Not 15, okay. And he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Next verse. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Next verse. And this sign shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Next verse. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Next verse. Pay attention. So then, after the Lord has spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Next verse. And they went forth. And preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them. And confirming the word with signs. Following. Amen. They went forth. Somebody say that very loud. Can I hear you speak like you have some strength? Alright. Did you observe that it's all go ye. Go ye therefore. They went forth. In evangelism we don't ask people to come. No. Don't ask people to come. Don't give them a hand beam. Come to our church. Come to our program. Eh, eh, that's not evangelism. Mm -mm. In evangelism, you go. Go ye. Go ye therefore. They went forth. They went forth. There is no evangelism of calling people to your house. Mm -mm. In evangelism, you go to them. Because evangelism takes with it the character of God. God came to us. So the evangelist must go to the people. We go to where the sinners are. Dr. T.L. Osborne wrote a book many years ago, out where the sinners are. You go to where they are. You go to them. You go to their homes. You meet them on the streets. You go to their offices. You meet them, you know, wherever they are, in their, in their homes. You go to wherever they are, out where the sinners are. Sinners are waiting for you. A sinner is not identified by his deeds. A sinner is identified by what he believes. A sinner is not identified by his deeds. A sinner is identified by what he believes. A sinner is not identified by his deeds. A sinner is identified by what he believes. So there will be signs with the gospel we preach. Look at Mark 16.20 carefully. Mark 16.20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. Where did they preach? 
everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word, not their tears. He was confirming the word with signs following amen. Question, what does God confirm? And what does God use in confirming the word? Huh? Oh, talk to me, church. So if you want to see signs, what do you do? Preach the word. When you preach the word, who will confirm the word? Not you. So you don't go and be arranging miracles. God confirms his word. When the word is preached. And sometimes you may not even know that miracles have happened. Because it's not showmanship. You may not know. Only the person who you are preaching to knows something has happened. Sometimes they may not tell you. They will let you go so that they can check. Three days. One week. I was coming back from the airport just one week ago. From the airport, you know, from Lagos. And a young man ran to me with a bag. He ran to me. He said, Papa. I looked at him. I didn't recognize him. He said, Papa, you can't recognize me. I know you can't recognize me. I left you a long time. I left you since 1995. I was in church. I used to be in your choir. You trained me. He was doing like he's rapping. You trained me. Man. He said, now I work with Exxon Mobil. I'm one of their staff. I just came back from the water. I'm going to be around for a few days and I go back. Papa, one thing I will never forget. On a Sunday morning, you just walked into the service and began to pray for the sick. I used to have ulcer. The ulcer died in that service. Till today, no trace of it. Papa, thank you again. I said, no, there's something more than healing. Get to my messages. What you had me preach that time is O syllabus. You need to hear what I'm preaching now. What I'm preaching now is what you need. Quickly, quickly, go and subscribe. He said, Papa, because you have said it, I trust you, I will do it. I say, if you do it, you will thank me later. I mean, the Lord confirmed his word. The guy got healed and didn't tell me till close to 20 something years after. But God did a work in him. When you preach the word, you must trust the word because it's not your word. The person that gave you the word is inside his word. Jesus is called the word of God. So if you preach the word, the word is in the word, working with the word. I don't know if I'm communicating at all. The word is in the word. So trust the word of God and preach it. Don't make it nice. Don't decorate it. Preach it the way it is. You're not smarter than God. Preach it the way it is. Let him that owns the word confirm his word. What does he confirm his word with? Signs. Preach the word. Preach it with confidence. Preach it by faith. Preach it by the power of the spirit and trust the spirit. So listen. There will be signs with the gospel we preach. There will be signs with the gospel we preach. Signs include demonstration of miracles. Signs includes demonstration of miracles. I believe in miracles absolutely because the message I preach carries with it miracle power. When we preach the word, signs follow the word. But these signs include demonstration of miracles as we go to preach. So as you are going to preach, know that you are carrying the word with miracle power. You are not carrying miracle power. I didn't say you are carrying miracle power. What did I say? You are carrying the word with miracle power. Exactly. That's very important. There's a difference between carrying miracle power and carrying the word with miracle power. They are not the same. Now, utterance, write down, revelation will be available as you speak by revelation. Utterance, revelation, they will be available as you speak. Gifts of the spirit, 
1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. These gifts will be evident as you preach the word. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, word of knowledge by the same Spirit, next verse. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, next verse. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. These gifts accompany you as you preach. These are the things you will experience as you give yourself to evangelism. These gifts are not for fun fair. They are tools for work. They are tools for soul winning. They are not for entertainment. They are tools that will follow you. Listen, let me, let me talk to you, Power City. Look at me, everybody. You think you, 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 you are not a miracle worker. That's what you think. If you will take the gospel to a place where people have not heard the gospel and preach it simply, the kind of miracles you will see, you will think you are in hard bunking. I'm not joking. The reason why you're not seeing miracles is because, first of all, you're not given to evangelism. And then number two, the reason why you want to see miracles is because you want to see miracles, which is showmanship. That's the only reason. If you go to where people are in darkness, they have not seen Christ. And you preach the simple message of the gospel. And you pray a miracle prayer. You will see miracles that will shock you yourself. I'm not joking. I'm very serious. It doesn't matter how long you got born again. Even if you just got born again today. If you take the gospel to a place where the gospel is needed, you will see the demonstration of God's power. Am I talking to somebody here? Because the message is not your message, it's his message. That's why one of the ways to train people to win souls is to take them to the field. Take them to the field, let them preach the message. And along with preaching, let them pray for the sick. Praying for the sick is a demonstration of the goodness of God. He went about doing and healing so healing is a demonstration of God's goodness. And the message is good news. And in the good news of the gospel is the goodness of God. In the good news of the gospel is the goodness of God. So when he said the Lord was working with them, what he means is that the gifts of the spirit were in operation. When he said the Lord was working with them, what he means is that the gift of the spirit was in operation. So the gifts of the spirit are present anywhere the gospel is preached. Listen to me. You can write this down. You have never lacked ability to communicate the gospel. You have never lacked ability to communicate the gospel. You can write it like, I have never lacked ability to communicate the gospel. You just didn't notice that you had that ability. You just didn't acknowledge that ability. You just didn't notice or you didn't know that you had that ability. Everybody say with me very loud, I flow with the spirit as I share the gospel of Christ. Say it again, I flow with the spirit as I share the gospel of Christ. One more time, I flow with the spirit as I share the gospel of Christ. Let's see a classical example here. Let me give you an introduction. You know, in the book of Acts, when you read the book of Acts, you will find something like Acts 4.33. Acts 4.33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. You will see in Acts chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. Chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. The apostles were the ones who had miracles, signs, and wonders. The apostles. The apostles. In chapter 2, 3, 4, and 5. It was only the apostles that had signs, miracles, and wonders. And there were many reasons for this. Number one, the church was in an ignorant state. The church was at a state of ignorance. Number two, everybody was just growing. 
They were waking up to the resurrection. They were waking up. The church in Acts was a church of baby Christians growing. It was not a church of giants. They were all babies. Spiritually learning how to walk. In the book of Acts. You will see a progression of the growth of the church. As you study through the book. So they were babies. Okay. And the only people that had some level of maturity were the apostles. So that's why it was only the apostles in the first five chapters. That were doing miracles. Now but follow this. Are you still in the building? All right. It was a new convert that brought the full gospel to the early church. A new convert. His name was Paul. Apostle Paul was the person that brought the full gospel to the church in the book of Acts. By Acts 6, you will find that miracles were no more only done by the apostles. From chapter 6, something shifted. Because now people were involved in preaching. So the miracles became more. People, the congregation started getting involved in preaching. It had nothing to do with the, with the apostles. It had everything to do with the message. It's not about how great a man of God is that makes miracles happen. It is the message that brings the miracles. It is not the title of the preacher that makes miracles. It is the message. The Lord was working with them, confirming what? His word. So anybody that will preach the word and preach it right, miracles will follow. So it is not the people. It's not the personalities. It is the message that miracles follow to accomplish. Are you still in the building? Alright, so the message of Jesus Christ is anointed with the gifts of the Spirit. The message of Jesus Christ is anointed with the gifts of the Spirit. The message of Jesus Christ is anointed with the Holy Spirit. So in Acts chapter 6, there was an issue that started with the women. Women. And then they had to appoint deacons. They had to appoint deacons. And one of the deacons was Philip. But before Philip, there was another deacon by the name of Stephen. Stephen was also a deacon. That Stephen that was stoned, that was killed, he was a deacon. Deacon means protocol, ushers, technical department, sound, cameraman. Okay? All those are deacons. Deacons have to do with physical responsibilities. And you will not believe that it is such people that were called Stephen. Stephen was one of the deacons. But look at what followed Stephen. So that you know it's not about title and position. Okay? These are deacons. So that you see how God operates. These are deacons. And Stephen was with miracles, signs, and wonders. In that same Acts. Look at it. Acts. Amen? Now, Acts chapter... Before I get into Stephen, let me just show you something quickly about, about, about Paul. Then we get to Stephen. Romans chapter 15 verse 18. Quickly. Romans 15 18. Romans 15, 18. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ had not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Next verse. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. I have fully preached. You know, it is from that verse that a guy that was called Demos Shekerian, I don't know if you remember, Demos Shekerian is the founder of Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship. How many of you know Full Gospel Businessmen? The founder of Full Gospel Businessmen worldwide, his name is Demos Shekerian. It is from this verse he came with the name Full Gospel. From this verse we are reading now. Put it up, that, that, that verse, put it up for me. I have round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Full gospel. Fully gospel. That's why God full gospel business meant for. Now what brother Paul was saying is that the full gospel of Christ is preaching with miracles. The full by word and deed preaching with miracles. You preach, you heal the sick. You preach, you, you believe God for miracles for the people. 
preaching and miracles. A combination of the two is called the full gospel. It's called the full gospel. When the gospel has signs and wonders. 1 Corinthians 4.20 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 20 1 Corinthians 4.20 for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. That's the slogan of our church. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. We preach the word with power. We preach the word with power. Are you still in the building? Right? Why is it with power? Look at 1 Corinthians 4.19. Why? Look at 419. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, and will know, not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. I'm not coming to make noise. I will preach the word, and power will follow it. I will preach the word, and miracles will follow it. I will preach the word, signs and wonders will follow it. Say with me, I preach the word with power. Say it very loud. I preach the word with power. Say it like you know what you're talking about. I preach the word with signs and wonders. I didn't hear powerful, amen. In Acts chapter 8 verse 5, you will see Philip. Acts 8 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. What did Philip do in Samaria? He preached what? Christ. Look at verse 4. Acts 8, 4. Acts 8, 4. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Acts 8, 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere doing what? Is it only the apostles that are preaching? Everybody, they were scattered by persecution. So when persecution scattered them, everybody started preaching. Everybody. Now churches will be forced to start training members. Churches will be forced. Pastors who, who know what they are doing, who have not been doing it, will start training members in case tomorrow there is a total lockdown. No church for six months. We must train our members to do ministry. That's the kingdom of God. People must be trained. It is persecution. Look, this one was persecution. This one is not even persecution. It's just Corona. This one was persecution. It scattered them. I believe that this coronavirus will turn for the furtherance of the gospel. Amen. Believe me. It will turn for the furtherance of the gospel. Everything about it. It will advance the kingdom of God. It will advance the kingdom of God. It will advance the kingdom of God. They were scattered abroad. They went everywhere. And one of them that went everywhere, his name is Philip. So Philip's example is one of them who went everywhere to preach the word. So Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ. So preaching the word is preaching Christ. If you're not preaching Christ, you're not preaching the word. Preaching the word is preaching Christ. If you're not preaching Christ, you're not preaching the word. In Acts chapter 8 verse 6, look at the outcome. Acts chapter 8 verse 6, when the word is preached and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. He preached and accompanying his preaching, miracles. Accom the first thing is preaching. Then what follows preaching is miracles. Give me the next verse. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. Verse 8. For there was great joy in that city. The gospel brings joy. The good news brings joy. He shares the gospel. Then there's miracles. Follow me. Follow the sequence. He shares the gospel. Then there's miracles, signs, and wonders. Before miracles, we find utterance. He preached. Before miracles, we find utterance. He preached. 
Then after utterance, signs and wonders. After utterance, signs and wonders. And this is Deacon Philip. There was someone else called Stephen. Another Deacon. Acts chapter 6 verse 8. Acts chapter 6 verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. These are deacons. These are deacons. These are not apostles. These are brothers in the church. These are brothers that are passionate. Brothers that are on fire. Serving the Lord. Did great wonders and signs. And these two guys were not apostles. They were deacons. Diaconos. These are people who did natural things in the church. Acts chapter 8. They saw miracles. There was another guy called Ananias. A certain disciple who met Saul of Tarsus. You remember him? He was a disciple. Who is a disciple? Somebody who is learning. Pastor Pray, see the humor. God's humor. You know? Paul is an apostle. But the apostle was discipled by a disciple. It's not an apostle that God Paul is a brother. Brother Ananias. And when he saw Paul, he said, Brother Paul. These are brothers. No title, no act bishop, act pope. Act deacon, deacon diaconos act. <laughs> Brother Paul. Glory to God. The more you know Christ, the easier your life becomes. All these stupid complications, they are all insecurities. And they are products of oppression. You didn't hear what I said. All these looking for big, big titles, they are products of oppression. It's part of slavery. It's a cover-up for insecurity. Trying to, to be important because you think you are not important. So you have to try to be. When you know you are, you don't try. You are what you are by the grace of God. Somebody say, I hear you. you know, don't need all those things. We're not defined by those titles. We're defined by Christ. Praise God. I say, praise the Lord. So, Ananias. Now, please look at Philip again. Acts chapter 8, verse 25. The man is preaching miracles, signs, and wonders are happening. Verse 25 of Acts chapter 8. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. In where? Many villages. Look at 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, unto Gaza, which is desert. Please pay attention here. So we find direction in his evangelism. He first of all, by choice, goes to evangelize. But as he begins to evangelize, he begins to receive supernatural direction on where to go. It is not supernatural direction first. It is go and preach. But as he begins to be involved with evangelism, the spirit now begins to tell him, go to that person. Go to that person. Now he is doing evangelism by direction. But it begins by simple obedience. Don't wait to be told go. Go. It's already written. Go ye therefore. You don't have to wait for God to shout go my son. God is speaking now. Go my son. And somebody said no. He didn't say go my daughter. He only said go my son. Go my daughter. <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, glory to God. So, you can be going and the spirit of God will lead you to somebody. Sometimes when you're going for evangelism, you're heading to a place. You will just see somebody and the spirit of God will say, that one. And then you come there. That, that is the leading. That's, that's when you begin to have leadings in evangelism. Expect them as you begin to evangelize. Expect leadings. And when you are led like that, you will find yourself saying the right things because that leading is supernatural. So you will find gifts of the spirits, revelation gifts, utterance. All that will be flowing because it is supernatural evangelism. Am I communicating now? That's what happened to this guy. 
He was led. He's preaching a crusade. The spirit told him, go, 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 go. And he left. Now, are you still in the building? Remember, he didn't start out with leading. He went out first. So there will be such peculiar instances where you will be led to certain individuals to share. You start by obeying general instructions. Then in the midst of obeying general instructions, you start getting revelation by the Holy Spirit. Go to that fellow. Go to the other. Look at Acts chapter 8 verse 30. Acts chapter 8 verse 30. Then Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? He's preaching. God said, Go, 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 go. And as he goes, he meets the man on the chariot, leading by the Spirit. And he preached unto him Jesus. He didn't preach favor for global wealth transfer. He preached unto him Jesus. He preached unto him Jesus. Look at verse 39 of Acts chapter 8. You will love that. Acts 8, 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Next verse. But Philip was found. He was caught. The next thing was he was found. He was found at Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. People gave themselves to preach and preach and preach and preach. So it's in the interruption of the spirit you will find a revelation. He is led by the spirit. He is caught by the spirit. Then he preaches the gospel with signs and wonders. I repeat. He is led by the spirit. He is caught by the spirit. Then he preaches the gospel with signs and wonders. Listen carefully. When we preach the gospel of Christ by the Old Testament understanding Preaching is prophesying. By the Old Testament understanding, when you preach, you are prophesying. When you speak by the Spirit, it's actually prophecy. When you speak the word of God by the Spirit, which is what you do, you're actually prophesying. You're making known the plan of God by the Spirit in human language. You're making known the plan of God in the Spirit. I mean by the Spirit in human language. In the Spirit... In human language. Are we still in the building? You are making known the plan of God in the spirit. By human language. So please listen carefully. The gospel is not miracles. The gospel is not miracles. The gospel is a message. Within that message there are miracles. The gospel is not miracles. The gospel is a message. Where a man believes. That Jesus died. He was buried. And he rose again the third day. Let's not get carried away by signs and wonders. Signs and wonders do not equate salvation. The miracles and signs are to confirm the message. The message still has to be preached. The message still has to be preached. And every one of us is equipped the same way with signs and wonders as we preach the message. Every one of us is equipped the same way with signs and wonders as he preaches the message. You preach the message of Christ. You will see power and glory. Blind eyes will open. I thought I would hear a good amen. amen. Cripples will walk. Amen. Deaf ears will be opened. Dead situations will come alive. You just preach the word. The word is power. And there are instances also where you will minister to people and they will be filled with the spirit. You get them to speak in tongues. You teach them. You minister the word of God to them. And they'll be filled with the spirit. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. God calls Ananias, who is just an ordinary brother, to pray for Paul. And give Paul, Paul foundation class. And Paul became the chief of all apostles. So every one of us can lay hands on the sick. Every one of us. We all are believers. We lay hands in this, on the sick as we go on the mission of the gospel. Say with me, I heal the sick by the Holy Ghost. Say with me, I heal the sick by the Holy Ghost. Say with me, I preach the word by the Holy Ghost. Say it again, I preach the word by the Holy Ghost. Say with me, I receive boldness to preach the word by the Holy Ghost. Say, I receive power to preach the word 
by the Holy Ghost. Say, these signs follow me as I preach the word. I heal the sick. I cast out demons. I raise the dead. I cleanse the lepers. These signs follow me as I preach the word. Rise on your feet and say with me very loud, I am a proof producer. I produce proof as I preach the word. I preach the word. I have utterance. Shout it very loud. I have utterance. I have boldness. Signs and wonders. Follow me. Signs and wonders. Follow me. As I preach the word. I preach the word. With boldness. Say I receive boldness. Say it again. I receive boldness. To preach the word. In Jesus name. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice in this building. I steer everyone up here to, to evangelism, discipleship. I steer up everyone here to obedience to the call of the Great Commission. And I decree that every excuse is terminated. Your people are steered up. Your people are equipped. Your people are built up. And as your people go forth to preach the word, these signs follow the word. In the name of Jesus. Wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice as your amen is coming like thunder, receive boldness. Receive boldness. Receive boldness. Receive boldness. Receive boldness. And with great grace, you will make manifest the resurrection. These signs follow you. Receive utterance. Receive utterance. Receive utterance. In the name of Jesus. Father, we rejoice. We rejoice that you have given to us and entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation. And we thank you for the privilege and the honor. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Turn to your neighbor and say, we are going out to preach this whole week. Make sure you are found. I didn't say touch your neighbor. I said tell your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, we are going out to preach this week. Make sure you are available. Make sure you are found. Don't go and hide. You are equipped to go out. You are saved to serve others. You are called to call others. You are found to help find others. You have learned. Make sure you don't receive the grace of God in vain. All of this investment that God is making on you is so that you can go out and make profit for his kingdom by bringing men to the knowledge of Christ. Now shout it very loud. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. Clap and celebrate, 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 celebrate. Is that how you celebrate in your village? Glory! Glory! Get a good offering. Let's give and worship Jesus today. Hallelujah. Those of you watching online, our banking details are there for you to, to honor the word of God with your givings. We give in faith. We give with joy. Father, I pray for everybody in this service. As we give today, we are so delighted. We are so elated. We are so excited. That your word comes with clarity. Your word comes with precision. And everybody under the sound of my voice is built up. And your word that has come to us, we give in honor of it. That through our givings, the gospel continues to spread all over the world. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen like thunder. Amen. Listen to me everybody. Throughout this week, we are all in the field, including our campuses. But listen carefully. If you are in a city where there is a complete lockdown. And there are instructions not to move out. Do your evangelism on social media and phone call. Don't go out. Obey the government of your nation. Did you hear what I said? But if you're in a city like my own, where government says we can continue to have services and we can move about freely, but we should maintain social distance and cleanliness. So we can go out and preach and talk to people about Christ. Evangelism is not hugging people. Evangelism is not hugging people. 
Evangelism is not shaking people. Evangelism is a message. You go only your mouth should be walking. Don't use your hand to walk. Use your mouth to walk. <laughs> and then there are cities also where, you know, um, uh, church gatherings are not allowed. And you're watching me. I'm talking to our global community where church gatherings are not allowed. But you are allowed to meet in a group of five or ten. So you can still go out. You have no excuse. You can still go out and talk to two, three, one, five people, even ten people, a whole group. You can share with them. But stay within the restrictions of the government where you operate from. Is it clear here? Throughout this week as a church, we're all on the field evangelizing, whether physically, by social media, YouTube, Facebook, telephone, WhatsApp, uh, and all the various platforms. We're all effectively winning souls this week. Can I hear a powerful amen? amen. Hey guys, you know we love you guys. Uh, don't forget to follow me online. The messages will keep coming out like fire on Facebook. 10 p.m. tonight, GMT plus one. Tomorrow morning, 6, 6 a.m., GMT plus one on Facebook. Tomorrow afternoon, 12 noon, GMT plus one. Three times every day, the word will be going out the whole of this week. And in the course of the week, I'm going to go live on Facebook. I'm going to go live on Kingdom Life Network all over Africa and all over Ghana Terrestrial. I'm going to go live in the course of the week. Announcements will be made on the times I'll be doing broadcasts because I want to share some things with you people, especially since people are at home. People need to feed on the word of God. We want to pump so much word to build people up and build their faith. So when you see our announcements on social media, help us spread it. Help us put it on on different platforms. Let's encourage more people to tabernacle around the word of God, even as we go through this period together, believing God that very soon the corona thing will be over. And listen, let me tell you, listen, everybody, listen, are you here? Listen, listen, listen. When this coronavirus is over, there will be a rise of new millionaires and billionaires. New businesses will be birthed because businesses will collapse a lot of things will collapse in the midst of this meltdown. Things are already collapsing and it will take people time to build back after the corona. In the midst of the rebuilding, new millionaires and billionaires will emerge. So my advice to you as members of my family is in this period of incubation, begin to prayerfully think of an idea, think of a concept, Think of things that you will do that will position you to make wealth. Am I saying something to somebody? Don't just be enjoying and say, well, there is no work. Let me just be enjoying. No, no, no. It's a time for strategic planning. It's a time for strategic thinking. Apart from evangelism, think about the things you will do with your life. Have I said something? That's my personal advice. We love you guys. Our campus is, we live in the able hands of our coordinators. Those of you that have done my assignment on evangelism, the tracks, Email it to me to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And in the church, yeah, if you have your own tracks you've written for me, you will drop it here before you go. We love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. Stay healthy. You know, observe social distance. Keep yourself in the love of God. Speak words of faith. Walk in faith. No fear here. Enjoy the freedom you have in Christ. Be blessed. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this great service this morning. Can somebody shout glory?